Thank you so much for starting your week with us on Up to Speed Live. Uh, this episode is a continuation of a conversation that started with Hans uh, just a few weeks ago regarding the rise in attacks uh, targeting the Asian American community. Uh, this, of course, uh, is near and dear uh, to my heart. Now, you might remember, as we take our video here, uh, our CEO took some time to declare uh, that hate uh, has no place here uh, in our company as well as our society. Uh, and so we invite you to watch the replay of this episode on Inside Verizon. Hans made a point that day to say we will continue to educate uh, the stakeholders, um, all of them, uh, in our communities, uh, in our companies, uh, in our lives, uh, and that's what we aim to do today uh, with this uh, conversation, to educate you. Now, in the days following that conversation, uh, so many of you reached out to us, not only uh, expressing uh, your willingness to support, but also wanting to learn more about some of the recent events uh, targeting Asian Americans and how our V-teamers are processing this topic. Uh, today, we have an opportunity to speak very candidly with some very special V-teamers, and they've got some news to share about how Verizon is giving back in a big way. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, today's panel, uh, and uh, we will uh, introduce with a little bit of levity here. Uh, so panelists, if you would humor me uh, as I introduce you, um, I want you to share your favorite family meal uh, growing up. Uh, so today uh, we have an opportunity here uh, to uh, talk about all kinds of topics, but we will start uh, with food. And I'm not sure if you could hear my dog, but uh, she heard uh, food, and uh, so she's ready to have this conversation as well. Uh, so number one, number one on our list here. Yes, yes, yes. We're talking about food. Okay, uh, we're going to start with Miguel, and Miguel Caroga, of course, is the CEO of Visible. Uh, Miguel, uh, talk to us about uh, your favorite food growing up. As I try and figure out how to uh, snack, uh, give us snacks to our dog here. So Miguel, thanks for joining us on Up to Speed. So I love the starting point, first of all, Andy. Uh, food is near and dear to my heart, as my team knows well. Um, I would say one of my fondest memories growing up is my uh, grandfather, uh, who was Chinese. He uh, he actually loved these type of like Sichuan um, chicken wings, but then he would also break out the hot chili oil at the same time, which you know, of course, made anyone's eyes tear to begin with. So that's one of my fondest memories of childhood food growing up. Uh, Miguel, I believe your, your mention of the hot chili oil uh, produced quite a few hearts on Twitter as we're live on Twitter here on Periscope, uh, so thank you for that. Um, joining us as well uh, from Team Visible, uh, Min Jae Orms, our um, Chief Marketing Officer for Visible. Uh, Min Jae, thank you for joining us and uh, your favorite food, please. Thanks so much for having me here, Andy. Um, in our family, the biggest deal was when we would go out to sushi. So I have to put a vote in for sushi as my favorite family meal. Excellent, excellent. And, uh, and then finally rounding out our uh, panel is Amber Nakamura, uh, who's with our small and medium business uh, team. And uh, all three of our panelists happen to be in Denver. Uh, and uh, it was not planned this way, but uh, Amber, uh, thank you for joining us. And your favorite family meal growing up, please. Awesome, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I actually have two different types of favorites. So since I am Japanese and I'm also Korean, one of my favorite Japanese snacks that my dad used to make us was Spam Musubi since we grew up in Hawaii. So we had that every Friday. And then over the weekend, my mom would actually make us bibimbap. You know, it's one of my favorite Korean dishes and it's because it's so colorful. You get to have all that sticky rice in there and you get to just decorate it the way you'd like it to. And sometimes it's so good, you wanna ask for seconds. And I will take seconds uh, as well, Amber. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, this is uh, this is making me very hungry. And it's great to have you all here. And I think we've successfully inspired our uh, colleagues to look up a few uh, new recipes. So turning now uh, to some food for thought, as I was watching uh, the recent coverage of uh, Asian American Pacific Islander advocates across the country hitting the streets, raising awareness, uh, there was a particular image and a message that caught my eye. Uh, this was a young woman holding a sign uh, that simply reads, love our people like you love our food. In so many meaningful ways, food has been the connected tissue uh, among countless Asian communities yearning to be a part uh, of our uniquely American experience. Now, if you're looking at this image and wondering where this kind of concern is coming from, some statistics that have come out since the start of the pandemic may give you uh, some context here. So as we go to the next slide, um, the group Stop AAPI Hate, a coalition uh, aimed at uh, addressing uh, anti-Asian discrimination during the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic says it has received more than 2,800 
first-hand reports of anti-Asian hate, including physical and verbal assaults between March 19th and December 31st of 2020. Now, the group believes that number has now exceeded 3,000, that women are attacked almost two and a half times more than men, with Asian American seniors being victims in more than 7% of those reports. Now, uh, that those numbers, um, many uh, Asian advocates believe that uh, the, uh, the numbers are underreported because of uh, the culture of, um, of assimilation and silence in many of our uh, Asian American, uh, especially our senior communities. And it's something that I hope we can start to talk about during this panel. So as we turn to our panel now, we'll start with Miguel. We mentioned we had some big news here. Uh, and like so many of our colleagues, I know you felt this was a moment not only to acknowledge what happened, uh, but to take action. So Miguel, tell us how uh, Visible aims to do that. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, first of all, I was struck by the uh, the visual you shared with us. I think it really sets the tone. Um, you know, I think one of the things we think about at Visible in particular, um, you know, myself, you know, being biracial, I'm, I'm both Chinese American and Bolivian American. You know, at Visible, we're actually proud to be an Asian-led company, Minjay and I, and others on the team. Um, we really reacted strongly to these terrible reports that you described here. Um, and it's hit especially close to home, I think, for many of us. Um, it was really great to see Hans, you know, be so vocal in support and many, many others inside the Verizon community and family. So I really want to say a big thank you to everyone across Verizon. Um, the big announcement for us is something that, you know, um, I wanted to share, something that Minjay and her team spearheaded, uh, a partnership with Gold House. So, so Gold House is a, a nonprofit collective of Asian American and Pacific Islander founders, creative voices and leaders. And we're incredibly honored to support Gold House with a $50,000 grant to help the organization continue their work of enabling and amplifying more authentic multicultural representation and really working towards societal equity through the development of small and medium-sized businesses. Um, built into visible in our mission and core values and purpose, it's really a desire to make the invisible visible. And by shining a light on communities and people who, so they actually do feel seen, heard, and empowered, we believe this can make a difference. You know, at the end of the day, hate against one is hate against all, and we're always going to aim to use our platform to support organizations that continue to fight systemic racism and actively work towards racial and social injustice. So we're really proud of our ability to help. It's just a small little step, uh, but it's something we wanted to share with everyone today. Miguel, thank you so much, and, and thank you for um, being such a, a wonderful role model and a leader uh, for all of us, and especially uh, as an Asian American uh, in our company. It's, it's wonderful to see you and, and Minjay doing great things, and of course, uh, a fantastic uh, show of support here uh, for Gold House. Uh, Minjay, uh, as Miguel mentioned, you have uh, leveraged social media uh, to address these issues, uh, to keep the conversation going, uh, and you've done this in such profound and personal ways what drives you to engage in those personal, personal ways and, and how can our teammates best amplify uh, AAPI voices? Um, thank you, Andy. I, I have to admit, I, I wasn't always um, perhaps as brave or vocal. <laughs> um, and, and this is part of, and I'm generalizing a little bit, but the cultural experience of being Asian and um, having immigrated from Korea to Canada when I was 13. And I think the, the first part of that life was about observing and figuring out how to fit in, right? Because a lot of the times when you're dropped in a new place, it's about figuring out how to mimic other people's behavior down to the clothing and how you say things and what do you like, what are your preferences to figure out how you can potentially belong in a community. I would say the past 10 years for me personally and professionally have been undoing a lot of that learning to figure out how can I actually belong somewhere without necessarily being exactly like everybody else and fitting in, but to be able to find people and be embraced because I am different. So in, in, in recent um, weeks and months and, and the year that we've all experienced, especially the conversations around racial justice and um, women's equity issues, it's an opportunity for me to try to give back to people who have given me the opportunity and opened the doors for me. And so it, it's the more that I am able to speak up and support the existing efforts like the Gold House efforts, um, I'm finding that there are more and more allies and people in the communities who, who have maybe also felt like I did 10 years ago or other people who are supporting each other's community and be able to lift everybody up instead of staying silent, which hurts all of us. 
Ben Jay, thank you very much. And of course, uh, if folks would like to see uh, some of your beautiful uh, writing and, and personal thoughts here, uh, please follow Ben Jay on all social channels, including uh, uh, LinkedIn, where you'll find uh, uh, many of those articles and, and a fantastic tweeter, by the way. Uh, so Ben Jay, thank you very much uh, for your perspective. Uh, so Amber, um, I know we've talked about what life has been like uh, in the retail space. Uh, you've been lucky enough to be in one space for quite a long time, and you've been throughout the pandemic as well. So you've seen our customer interactions evolve over the past year. Um, what can we all do to maintain uh, a commitment to diversity and inclusion, especially with every interaction? You have probably seen the gamut uh, of interactions. Tell us what that's been like and, and how, um, within the scope of this conversation, how those interactions have affected you. Yeah, most definitely. So, you know, growing up here in America, I was born and raised in Oregon, and my parents have always taught me to speak up in the most educational way possible. So, for example, we do have customers or just individuals in general that do ask us questions that we believe that might be based off ignorant. But my parents did teach me there are times where there are individuals that they ask you a specific question, but they don't understand or they don't know that the question is something that they shouldn't have asked to where we shouldn't say, oh, that wasn't the wrong thing to say, but we should more think of maybe they're just not educated on what to say. So, for example, like there are times where people come up to me at the retail store when I used to be a manager and, you know, we greet them, ask them what they do, uh, we need to do to come into the store. And, you know, there are times where we try to do small talk and there are times where customers are like, oh, is Amber your your real name or is do you have an Asian name? And there are times where it's like, you know, I'm not sure why you asked that question, but at the same time, it's to where you're probably just not educated to where I actually, my first name is Amber on my birth certificate. So I take the opportunity to have that conversation with the customer rather than biting back at them because they don't know. And I think that because of that, it helps our store and our community here in Aurora that I'm able to deliver that type of conversation with other customers. And plus we have a, a bunch of Korean uh, Koreans in our community to where they do feel comfortable coming into our store as well, because one, we're very diverse Two, They know someone who's also Korean three, they do feel safe at our store. So I think because we deliver such a safe environment at our location, that our location has become a open arms to everyone here in Aurora and in Denver as well. Yeah, and I, and I think the uh, the campaign, the Call for Kindness campaign, is so critical in that regard as well. And, and Amber, it's, it's funny that you mentioned even even names. I mean, you'll see even in, in the byline, my, my legal name is, is Jun Young Choi. And, and people often wonder, you know, where did you find, where did you get that name Andy? And I've, been, I've gone by Andy my whole life. Uh, I just happened to be born in Seoul. So, um, so let's talk about identity. Because uh, that's really what it boils down to it. And, um, and Minjay, we'll go back to you as we um, take, let's go ahead and take the slide of, uh, uh, of Minjay's uh, uh, social post. So please make sure to take a, take a look at you know, all that uh, Minjay has done in terms of uh, uh, spreading awareness here. And I think, uh, Minjay, I wanted to just talk to you about you know, what is identity to you when it comes to Asian America? It's, it's one of those things where we don't want to look at something so monolithically but also there are certain cultural elements that um, perhaps keep us from the individualism that may remedy some of this. But talk to us about, it, you know, in your, whether it's in your writings or in the ways that you, you've engaged with our, our teammates and, and the world. Um, how would you define identity right now in the Asian American community? Boy, uh, I think, I think it's, it's, it's complex and, and um personal to all of us. I, on the one hand, race is a construct. It is something that was systematically designed to create ways in which people are um, having to think about how, who are they and how are they showing up in ways that's perhaps a little bit different from even their personal experiences. And unfortunately, the experience of racism is by design divisive. It is designed to separate us and hope that we remain fractured and that we sometimes even in, in communities of colors stay that way and, and sometimes pitted against each other. Whereas what I find really rewarding about these more personal connections and my ability to have conversations with you, Andy and Amber and Miguel and, and these communities of people that you're showing on the screen is that 
first, the, the idea of Asian is so broad, and we all kind of have different cultural upbringings or the country that we identify with and all of that that defines us in personal ways. And, and because of that, because of the differences, because of the different flavors, because of the different ways in which we, we feel who we are as people is actually ultimately what unites us. It's not other people's construct of race in itself that puts us in the same category, but it's about our personal experiences and what we share as people that unites us. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that more and more through these conversations and actions and being able to lift each other up in each other's communities that we be able to define who we are and how we show up and how we ultimately show up for each other in ways that are coming from here and, and defined by us instead of feeling like we have to be defined by a construct that oppresses all of us. NJ, I knew I uh, threw a big question at you to start things off here, uh, you know, I'll, and um, I knew you'd deliver. Uh, and uh, and Miguel, I'll, I'll extend that question to you and really kind of, you know, when when we're talking about leadership roles and 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 moving up uh, in the world, um, the the Asianness, your your Asianness, your Asian identity. Um, uh, you know, you were very quick to point out that Visible is an Asian-led company, uh, and, and that fills me with pride, and it should fill all of us with pride. But talk to us about where do you feel sometimes the, the delineation be between who you are as a professional and, and who you are in your personal life. Um, talk to us about how, how you marry those two, um, those, those two ideas of identity. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think... Um... You know, I was I was raised in a professional environment where bringing your full self to work wasn't always the natural outcome of being successful. And I think there's a massive shift in the last decade in particular. Uh, you see it happening across um, a lot of companies and Verizon in many ways has been leading that emphasis around, you know, you can be your full self, fully transparent, be everything you are, and that's just enough. And as someone who grew up in the United States, um, you know, that, that element of Asian, like just assume that basically you fit into a box. Uh, I liked how Minje described like, you know, like in many ways race as a construct, because I think that's so true. It's so easy for people to be put in boxes. And I think oftentimes that experience that I've had of being felt like being put in a box because of who I was or who I wasn't or what I did or didn't do, was I just enough of an Asian American or just enough of a Hispanic American or just enough, just enough of a professional in a professional setting, um, I think was something I really wrestled with a lot. Uh, and it's something I think I still work through. But candidly, I think what's important now is if we think of ourselves as being put into the box, that's going to be a problem because, you know, together we're better, but separate we're alone and apart. And whether that's within the Asian community or beyond any community, you know, we're all humans at the end of the day. And I think what I what is really strikes me about all of the activity that's happening is it's a level of dehumanization. And when and dehumanization is a slippery slope because with dehumanization, lots of bad things happen. All these atrocities you've seen throughout history stem from that ability to put someone outside the sphere of somebody you believe is also your fellow human. The closer we can get to that, the faster we can focus to listen, to understand. I love the way Amber was describing about like, look, assume positive intent. We're just gonna be better as a society. So I'm encouraged, but there's a lot of work to do. It's wonderful. It's, it's just powerful to even be on this panel with you moderating and, and hearing these words. It, it's giving me uh, power to say, yes, bring your full self to work and be proud of it. Uh, Amber, um, as we uh, start to close the panel here, I want to uh, mention that, you know, you have um, you, you grew up in the Bay Area. You have family there. Uh, and, and of course, uh, in the short term here, we're all thinking of our, our loved ones, especially our older uh, loved ones, our family members. Tell us about um, how they're doing, how, what's going on, what's the conversation been like, and, and hopefully everything's um, okay with you and your family. Yeah, most definitely. So I actually have my mom here in Denver with me, but it, it comes to the point where there are times I do actually get worried for her because she's very sensitive. And if there's an altercation that happens maybe at a grocery store and I'm not around, I do get worried that she might get too frustrated and, you know, there would be a bad outcome. So during the pandemic, it's actually sadly have given me a good excuse to keep her home not just because of the virus but at the same time i'm able to protect her from any harm that could happen could be car accidents could be altercations at the grocery store or even in the parking lot 
And back home in the Bay Area, you know, I, I have my whole mom's side there. So my grandmother, we actually keep her home as well. Same perspective. We want to keep her safe from, you know, the virus. But at the same time, there's so many things that go out in the world. It's just you walk out the door and something that you have planned for your entire day can just disappear within seconds. So I think it's also very important that for my family that, you know, we want to make sure we protect our loved ones as much as we can but also have a positive outlook on it being like, you know, this is our plan for today. This is what we're going to do. And we're going to communicate each with each other and everything. So I believe that, you know, with the, the things that are going on in the Bay Area with all the incidents that are happening, I believe that, you know, if we have a positive mindset of that, we're going to be doing better as a community, kind of being like the bigger person, we can definitely make a difference in our voices to be heard, not just in the Bay, but possibly nationwide as well. And Amber, Minjay, Miguel, this conversation has uh, brought on quite a few comments here, not only about our favorite foods, but certainly in the replies of uh, Twitter here, uh, some some great uh, thoughts uh, from our from our V team and our viewers as well. And we encourage folks to continue that conversation on Twitter, retweet, reply, like this post, share with your loved ones, of course. Uh, but uh, as we do close, uh, uh, I, we, I do want to mention uh, Miguel and Minjay. I cannot let you go uh, before we talk a little bit about the uh, incredible ways Visible uh, continues to make a splash and. Uh, uh, you've enlisted the help of uh, one Mr. Kevin Bacon in a spot many of us saw uh, during the Grammys last night. So let's go ahead and roll just a snippet of that. Kevin Bacon here. You know me from six degrees of, well, me. All right, so the man with the extensive networking helps the best network here. Uh, so Minjay, as our visible CMO, tell us more about the message we're seeing in this spot right now. Absolutely. Um, so as many of you know, um, speaking of community, Visible from day one has been growing with our members. Many of the folks who signed up three years ago are still part of our member base. So one of the things that we really wanted to double down and introduce again this year was this notion of growing with our community. And who better than Kevin Bacon, who owns this iconic concept of community himself in the six degrees, which we now extended to 12 degrees. Um, so really, the idea here is Visible is a wireless that gets better with friends. And so we wanted to put this idea behind with the cultural icon and the concept to be able to tell people, of course, more about the fact that we are powered by Verizon. Of course, the fact that you get the best value for what you're buying here because of our business model. But most importantly, that we are a business that gets better by having more people in it as part of our community because of their ability to join our parties and save money, but also to be able to bring other people into visible network and be able to save more, even more money. Um, so we're really fortunate that we were able to come upon this creative concept and work with Kevin Bacon. Um, but I do have to take a moment to um, thank Diego and Ronan for their continued support for our business and really pushing us to think about creative ways in which to bring this message out to market, which has been really exciting. It's a wonderful story that you and the team continue to share in really meaningful and fun ways. So congratulations to you and the team, uh, Minjay and Miguel. You see this ad, you're making those solid connections with our growing customer base. Uh, tell us what's next. Uh, what's on the horizon for Visible? Yeah, we're, we're super excited with the ad and kudos to uh, Minjay and team and all the support we got across all of Verizon. Uh, as as Minjay mentioned, Ronan and Diego were key towards helping us kind of craft a lot of the story throughout the years that we've been sharing. I think it's the same story we've been saying from day one. What, what would the simple, easy to use experience look like in the wireless industry? Uh, we felt that answer was ultimately visible. Every evolution, every change from the shifts to party pay to the more recent introduction of the eSIM orientation of how we grow, the community-centric kind of orientation of member growth, that's been a part of our story. It's gonna continue to be. Uh, and we're super excited to just have another kind of uh, data point uh, sharing of Kevin Bacon to help us share the story as well. Fantastic. So as we get into our sort of inner Kevin Bacon mode, I want uh, all of us on the V team here uh, to think about ways uh, that we can continue making uh, connections, uh, uh, not just uh, professionally, but of course, personally, uh, the way that Miguel explained that we bring our true selves to work uh, and magic happens. Uh, uh, to Miguel, Minjay, Amber, I want to thank you so much uh, for pro providing such honesty and deep and meaningful thought uh, for uh, for our conversation. And of course, uh, this hopefully this conversation continues 
uh, and folks, uh, feel free uh, uh, to, I, I'm going to speak for the entire panel here, but reach out to us uh, if you have any more questions about about this particular topic, because it is it is near and dear uh, to our hearts, and, and we are so thankful that we are uh, with a Verizon family uh, that believes the same. Uh, so thank you so much. We'll continue our conversation here on Up to Speed, of course, all week. I want to thank the panel, and I want to thank all of you for watching. Have a great start to the week, and until next time, you're up to speed.